Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Friends' annual meeting. Happy Sunday. I see we have a good amount of people here. Hello. I'm going to share my screen with you all really quickly. All right. Now, while you are all getting settled and we are waiting for a few more to join us, I wanted to go over some Zoom housekeeping before we get started. This webinar will run for about an hour and a half. If you're new to Zoom webinar, I'm going to run a few things to quickly familiarize you. You'll notice that your microphone is muted. That's why we can't hear you talk. And that is because with so many of us here together, it is best to give everyone the best chance to hear the speakers clearly and without each other's background noise. Your cameras are also turned off so we can pay full attention to the speakers. Throughout this webinar, there are two ways to interact with us, through the Q&A or the chat box. With so many of you on this webinar right now, we've decided it's best to hold all questions until the end of the webinar to ensure we have enough time to get through everything. After the featured speakers have presented, we will go straight into Q&A for about 10 minutes. If you have a question for the speakers or anything related to the presentation, please type your question into the Q&A box below in the black toolbar on the bottom of your computer screen. Or if you're using a smart device, such as an iPad, the toolbar may be at the top of your screen. And if you just don't see the toolbar at all, try moving your mouse towards the bottom of the screen and it should come up. Once the Q&A begins, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions personally to the speakers. If you have a question for me about Zoom or about friends, then please type your questions into the chat box. Maybe you'd like to receive emails about how to get involved or stay updated with future webinars. Let us know. If you accidentally leave a question for Jen, Kevin, or Say Autumn during the webinar in the chat box, just know it might be missed because we are watching the webinar. To ask me a question in the chat box, see the chat icon again at the bottom of your screen. Type your question and click enter to send. Please know, unless you send this question directly only to me, everyone on the webinar will be able to see your question. For the largest viewing options of our speaker on your computer screen, click speaker view at the top right hand of your Zoom screen. This enables whoever is speaking to be the main face or screen you see. We are recording the annual meeting and we'll post the video online soon within a few days for folks who were not able to join us this afternoon. Every one of Friends' webinars are posted on our YouTube channel as well as our website at gorgefriends.org. And now this concludes our Zoom housekeeping. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, thank you for joining Friends' 41st annual meeting. What a beautiful afternoon to be together. The theme for this year's annual me meeting is moving to what shall be, inspired by a line in Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem. In this meeting, we will be looking both at the challenges and adversity dealt with by friends over the past year, as well as looking at the challenges and opportunities ahead to protect, preserve, and steward the Columbia Gorge in a social, economic, and political landscape that was strained by the pandemic, continued social injustice, and growing localized climate change impacts here in the Pacific Northwest. For those who might not know me, hello, I'm Melissa Gonzalez, and I am your host this afternoon. I am Friends' Outdoor Programs and Communications Specialist, and in this role, I manage Friends' Outdoor Activities and Programs. I assist with the production of Friends' quarterly newsletters, publications, and graphics. I educate the public about responsible recreation in order to help protect, preserve, and steward the Columbia Gorge. Before we get started, I wanted to run through the agenda for today. We will begin by honoring all those who have been lost to COVID-19 with a moment of silence. I will read our land acknowledgement too. We will then transition to our speakers for the afternoon with Friends Board member Jen Lovejoy with opening remarks, 
following by Friends Executive Director Kevin Gorman, and then our featured speaker, Say Autumn Edmo. We will then jump into Q&A with all speakers. Now, we are going to take a moment of silence for the 3 million lives that were lost worldwide during the COVID-19 pandemic. This moment of silence is about acknowledging the lives that have been lost, for those who have lost a loved one or had one who fell ill, acknowledging the ongoing impacts on communities across the Pacific Northwest and the globe, acknowledging the overwhelming loss we as a society have faced. Let's take this time together. Thank you. Before I begin, I want to honor the indigenous people who lived in the gorge since time immemorial, before being forcefully removed and relocated by settler colonization and the United States government. Through the Treaty of 1855 between the tribes and the United States government, the Warm Springs, Yakima, Ness Paris and Umatilla retain rights to these lands to this day. And the United States was given the right to live, govern, and do business on this land if we honor and uphold that treaty. Friends supports the tribes in their efforts to defend the rights they reserve through the treaties. Tribal people have greatly influenced gorge preservation and still do today as leading conservationists and the original caretakers of the land. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Jen Lovejoy, who joined Friends' Board of Directors in 2020. Jen is an associate professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Portland. She teaches media and journalism courses, quantitative research methods, design thinking, and courses in the leadership program. Jen came to the board as a result of her fascination with the intersection of land use and conservation, media and social media influences, and local and regional politics. Her prior board experiences include work in strategic planning, planning and innovation leadership. Jen, the virtual stage is yours. Thanks for the warm introduction, Melissa. It's an honor to offer some opening thoughts here to us all. So I was born at home on a 32 elevation, at 3200 elevation on a plateau in Eastern Washington to a third generation ranching family amidst the balsam root, Indian paintbrush, sago lilies, buttercups, shooting stars, bluebells, bitterroot or rock rose, sage and lupin, tall rye grass, fescue and antelope bitterbrush. I grew up following my mother's hiking boots in the Cascades, contributing to my family's livelihood by driving wheat summer at age 13, fixing fence, fighting for a second helping at the dinner table with my four brothers, and believing that to make a difference in the world, you had to remember where you came from. And I came from wide landscapes, mountain views, the smell of land, changing seasons. I knew when I settled here in the Gorge area that these landscapes are where I wanted to make a difference. I read about friends' work, followed their media coverage, and listened to an ever-increasing conversation on the value of public lands, miles of trails, nurturing respite, and educational opportunity afforded by land in the gorge. I'm in awe, complete awe, of the geological swath of the gorge and the lasting space it captures in people's hearts. It's really beyond special. And I imagine you all relate to this uniqueness of the land gorge, the gorge land, excuse me, and the ecosystem here. We need these common efforts to bring us together always, but it seems increasingly now. Land and conservation of land can potentially do that unifying work because it's not about us as individuals, but it's about something bigger and broader. 
really so much more impactful, land conservation that speaks to generational legacy and a broad hope for the future. So we're brought together today in some varying forms of unity simply around place, this place. Many of us consider home, plants, animals, non-human animals, rocks and minerals, fungus, microbacteria, all living in reciprocity of a place we may call home. My husband and I currently own and operate a farm and cidery out here on Sobe Island, which is 10 miles northwest of Portland. And as we all likely know, it's the largest river island in the country. It's encapsulated by the Columbia that comes through the gorge, unifying many of us, the Willamette River and the Multnomah Channel. We have three kids, Georgia, age 10, Sawyer, age eight, and Roan, like the color of a horse, age five. Parenting is full of self-reflection, tons of humility, unbridled, stop you in mid-stride wonder. But nothing is as tender as parenting, which has deepened my commitment to caring for the natural world and for all of life as we know it. I think of the dormant seeds, the unfurling of pine pollen, the regeneration of forest floors, the wood wide web of mycelium intertwining under my feet as I take my kids hiking up Hamilton Mountain near Stevenson, Washington. This is generational interconnectivity. This exploration of connecting myself and subsequently the next generation to the natural world and the synchronicity of connection I feel back. Really simply, I believe in holding the gorge. It holds us. As Robin Wall Kamimura writes in Braiding Sweetgrass, she says, quote, this is really why I made my daughters learn to garden. So they would always have a mother to love them long after I am gone. I feel this way about the gorge. As a college professor, I also feel this interconnectedness between generations and ecosystems, the interdependence of humans to our wild spaces, both in nature and in urban settings. I'm currently teaching a special topics class for seniors only called Embodiments of Place, Ecology, Trauma and Belonging. In the face of deep social and ecological crisis, we are tuning back to the body and the land and to our lived experience of all five of our senses in an effort to acknowledge the trauma of life, connect to the present and reflect, ask, critique our way toward an embodied, connected and deeply collaborative future with our larger and living natural world. This is really hard work. College students and many of us have spent years attending to devices and mediated worlds that carry us far away from the present. Yet I have never felt like college students want anything more than they want this. They want to deepen their connection to the natural surroundings, be it city parks, a tree outside their dorm room, or a newfound trail off the Klickitat River. They want it. For college students, there is a necessary, not sufficient sensibility about caring for the environment. And what I mean here is that it's, it's not enough to be a good steward of the land, recycle, drive less, pick up trash, not buy single use plastics. It is simply necessary to do those things, yet it's not enough. What we need, and this is what the youth have taught me, is we need advocacy, we need action, we need bigger strokes that change policy and protect land. This is, I believe, why I joined Friends of the Columbia Gorge. We care and we act, we listen and we speak, we steward and we advocate. For almost a year, a group of board members and I have been meeting to work on diversity, equity and inclusion for friends. The meetings are humbling, deeply vulnerable, circular sometimes, inviting and can be frustrating. Yet the amount of heart, just pure belief and dedication our whole board has for the work of friends does give me and all of us a longer breath and a greater hope. Each meeting and interaction I have with friends, anyone associated with friends, offers me this gift that I tuck in my pocket daily. So here's to all of you, paying attention, asking, contributing, drawing, listening, volunteering, signing, writing policy leaders, donating time and resources, caring and advocating. We feel it, we really do. We feel the strength of our efforts, the unifying strength the gorge brings all of us. It's up to us to welcome and provide that inclusivity to each other, to invite and ask for difference to be let in, to listen to an undercurrent or to find a new trail or a new trail buddy, to pause, 
to notice an unrecognized plant species or discover a new community meeting to attend. This is meaning making. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Friends of the Columbia Gorge Executive Director, Kevin Gorman. Kevin is one of the most eloquent and determined leaders I've worked with. He seamlessly invites all of us to contribute while being incredibly rigorous and passionate about Friends vision. Kevin and I send articles back and forth, share in learning and much unknowing, and he brings a contagious energy to all of us. With gratitude and joy, I welcome Kevin Gorman, Friends Executive Director to the 2021 Friends Annual Meeting. <clears throat> Thank you, Jen. That was, that was beautiful. Um, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining what is hopefully one of our final virtual gatherings. I truly believe we will see each other soon face to face in the gorge. But in the meantime, I hope you're sitting outside or at least you have the window open and the breeze is coming in. As Jen said, my name's Kevin Gorman. I'm the executive director at Friends of the Columbia Gorge. And my hope today is to take a short look back at our work over the past year, but also spend some time in the here and now, uh, as well as looking forward. But before I do that, I want to play a short video that helps shape our meeting. And as Melissa alluded to, it features a young woman, Amanda Gorman, who inspired the world on Inauguration Day. So here is Amanda Gorman reciting her poem, Earthwise, Earthrise. Christmas Eve, 1968, astronaut Bill Anders snapped a photo of the Earth as Apollo 8 orbited the moon. Those three guys were surprised to see from their eyes a planet looked like an Earthrise, a blue orb hovering over the moon's gray horizon with deep oceans and silver skies. It was our world's first glance at itself, a first chance to see a shared reality, a declared stance and a commonality, a glimpse into a planet's mirror. And as such drew nearer, our own urgency became clearer as we realize that we hold nothing dearer than this floating body we all call home. We've known that we're caught in the throes of climactic changes some say will just go away while some simply pray to survive another day. For it is the obscure, the oppressed, the poor who when the disaster is declared done still suffer more than anyone. Climate change is the single greatest challenge of our time. Of this, you're certainly aware. It's saddening, but I cannot spare you from knowing an inconvenient fact because it's getting the facts straight that gets us to act and not to wait. So I tell you this not to scare you, but to prepare you, to dare you to dream a different reality where despite disparities, we all care to protect this world, this riddled blue marvel, this little true marvel to master the verb and the nerve to see how we can serve Earth planets. You don't need to be a politician to make it your mission to conserve, to protect, to preserve that one and only home that is ours. To use your unique power to give next generations the planet they deserve. We are demonstrating, creating, advocating to heed this inconvenient truth because we need to be anything but leading it with the future of our youth. And while this is a training and sustaining the future of our planet, there is no rehearsal. The time is now, 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 because the reversal of harm and protection of a future so universal to be anything but controversial. So, Earth, pale blue dots we will fail you not just as we chose to go to the moon we know it's never too soon to choose hope we choose to do more than cope with climate change we choose to end it we refuse to lose we do this and more not because it's very easy or nice but because it is necessary <laughs> 
because with every dawn we carry the weights of the fates of this celestial body orbiting a star and as heavy as the weight sounded it doesn't hold us down but it keeps us grounded steady ready because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth rise to see it close your eyes visualize that all of us in this room and outside of these walls or in these halls, all of us change makers are in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space and we see the face of a planet anew. We relish the view, we witness its round green and brilliant blue, which inspires us to ask deeply, wholly, what can we do? Open your eyes, know the future of this wise planet is right in sight, right in all of us. Trust this earth uprising, all of us bring light to exciting solutions never tried before, for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for. Well, I think as Joe Biden found out on Inauguration Day, Amanda Gorman is the one hard act to follow, but I will do my best here. So 13 months ago, which feels like a lifetime ago, we were all going about our usual business when the world turned upside down by COVID-19. Like everyone on this call, our organization was stricken with fear, confusion, and uncertainty. But because of everyone on this call, Friends of the Columbia Gorge endured, and in some cases thrived, developing new skills and even collecting some solid conservation victories. Now, one of those victories was significant improvements to the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Areas Management Plan. This is a plan that's used by the Gorge Commission, Gorge Counties, and the US Forest Service to manage and protect the gorge. And I want to talk to you about three improvements that came out of this management plan and its revision, um, in large part due to the work of our staff and you pushing to get, these, get the agencies to really think broader. So these improvements all tie into the climate resiliency that we're all working on. And to do this, we brought in uh, a a woman, a graphic recorder. And she is gonna help us walk through this here. So if you give me just a second. So one of the um, things to think about is when you look at a 300 page document and all its regulations, it is tedious, it is difficult to grasp, but it is so important. This plan drives everything in the National Scenic Area. Let's say you wanna use the management plan to give salmon a fighting chance when they migrate through the gorge. We know that salmon need cold water refuge from warm water temperatures in the Columbia River during the summer. Well, we succeeded in getting wider protective natural buffers along certain streams in the gorge, meaning new development has to be set back 200 feet from these streams allowing trees to provide shade, creeks to meander, and stream temperatures to stay cool. Let's say you wanna protect wetlands. Well, why wetlands? Because they are among the most biologically diverse places on the planet. They're also considered the kidneys of the landscape in that they clean polluted water, prevent floods, protect shorelines, and recharge drinking water aquifers. Now the previous management plan called for a no net loss of wetlands, which might sound good, but what it actually means is that developers can take a perfectly good wetland, like the one Carrie is drawing right here, and then they can destroy it as long as they recreate a new one over here. And guess what? While we humans are very good at making babies and martinis, we are not good as humans at making wetlands. So our staff worked hours and hours to convince the commission to prohibit the destruction of wetlands and delete the word net 
from the wetlands language. Now no wetlands can be altered or destroyed and the prognosis of the gorge kidneys looks better than ever. We also remember the fires of last September and the tremendous loss of lives and property. Looking forward, one of the best ways to reduce the risk of wildfires and avoid destruction of homes and loss of life from wildfires is to avoid siting new houses in forest land. Friend staff worked with the commissioners to change the management plan to prohibit new houses from being built in more, most forest zones in the gorge. So revising and improving the gorge's management plan has helped make the gorge a better place for migrating salmon, for birds that rely on wetlands and communities who face wildfires. And we couldn't have done it without the hundreds of people who wrote letters to the commission and showed up on Zoom for Gorge Commission meetings. Gorge commissioners heard you and they responded and all of us are better for it. So I wanna thank Carrie Frickman again as our graphic recorder for helping bring those changes to life. Now 2020 also meant victories for our land trust. And as you read in our newsletter, Friends Land Trust made a really big, impressive purchase last year. And that was a four acre purchase that's surrounded by public land at Catherine Creek. And here you see it right there. Shortly after we bought it, the cleanup began and already we're seeing improvements. Now this, this property sits right next to the Catherine Creek parking area, which I'm sure today does not look like this. There's probably over 100 cars trying to sandwich in there. This is a popular area and it includes trails as, along with a, a, a paved accessible trail close to the property. Over the next year, we're going to be looking at how we can make this property really live up to its best and highest uses. And we'll be looking more at that in the coming, coming um, months here. Now, 50 miles um, west of Catherine Creek is the top of Cape Horn. And there's another property here that we acquired in 2020. Our founder, Nancy Russell, worked out a deal with a landowner over 15 years ago. And when the landowner passed away in September at the age of 93, we were able to secure permanent ownership of this property right here. The property is surrounded by public land as well as property we purchased as part of the Preserve the Wonder campaign. Now like Cape, uh, Catherine Creek, this property has great potential for um, facilities as well as, as well as being close to the Nancy Russell Overlook. Now, we're going to dive into planning processes for both Catherine Creek and Cape Horn in the coming months. And we'll be giving people a chance to visit both properties soon. But I want to emphasize that these places are more than just beautiful. They are places that help us expand the idea of who is welcome in the Columbia Gorge. So I want to leave you with this as we move forward. One of the ways each of us survived 2020 was to embrace the contradictions. As the pandemic made us more isolated, we found ways to stay connected. As we felt defenseless, we became more self-reliant. We embraced the contradictions of our time as it was the only way to make sense of what we were facing. Now, embracing contradictions will be the territory of Friends of the Columbia Gorge and how we operate in the coming years. As our organization has grown and the gorge gets more popular, the complexities grow. How do we protect an area that millions clamor to visit? How do we limit development yet authentically support affordable housing projects? How do we operate as an unwavering watchdog and still compassionately support communities. I believe we must do it with honesty. We do it with intention. 
And we do it with the understanding that there is no simple singular solution to the problems we face. When I was considering joining the staff of Friends of the Columbia Gorge over 20 years ago, I was counseled by some of my colleagues in the conservation world to instead work to protect more pristine wild places because the gorge was already compromised with towns and dams and highways. They felt that the gorge could not be preserved or protected in the highest sense because of the impact humans that was, was already prevalent and profound. And as you have clearly figured out, I ignored that advice because I believed what some might consider a weakness, the intersection of people and place in the gorge can be harnessed into its superpower. If we humans are to come to a reckoning with our role in preserving this planet, we must start with where we live, where we gather with loved ones, and where we are pulled to when we are happy or sad. The gorge is such a place and it must be preserved for us and future generations. It must be made safe and free of hate for all people who live there and visit there. And when you are in such a place, you can't help but feel that you are home. And our species is hardwired to protect our home. And that leads me to our keynote speaker, Seattle Medmo. If anyone feels the gorge calling her home, it is Seattle. Seattle is Shoshone, Bannock, Nez Perce, and Yakima. And her ancestors are from Salilo, a fishing village along the Columbia River and one of the oldest known settlements in the West. Seattle is the executive director of the MRG Foundation, an activist-oriented social justice charitable foundation, which provided over $3 million to nonprofits last year. Unlike most foundations, MRG actively works to promote social changes within with marginalized organizations, and they fund new and untested ideas to move disadvantaged communities forward. Now, prior to joining MRG, Seattle was the Sovereignty Program Director at the Western State Center, where she worked with a coalition that helped secure passage of Oregon Senate Bill 13 in 2017. It was a law that established and provided funding for the teaching of Indian history and sovereignty in K through 12 schools throughout the state. Now I met Seattle about a year ago when like you, I watched the unfolding Warm Springs water crisis and felt helpless seeing fellow Oregonians and the native people of these lands go without a basic human right, access to clean water. Seattle worked with the Warm Springs Tribal Council to create a partnership called the Chush Fund housed with an MRG foundation. It is a unique agreement between a charitable foundation and a sovereign nation to accept donations to address immediate needs. The Chush Fund not only began providing funds to the tribes during the crisis, it opened the door for organizations like ours to lend our support. So friends reached out to some of our colleagues like Columbia Riverkeeper, the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy, Columbia Land Trust, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Deschutes Land Trust, and others to create a coalition to support the Chush Fund's goals. Seattle has been a guiding force for all of us and her experience in fostering relationships and collaboration between tribes and nonprofits has been invaluable. I love her passion for writing a better future for this region and our planet. And so with that, here is Seattle Edmo. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us today on a beautiful, beautiful day um, here. I'm in Gresham, Oregon, um, coming to you from my, um, my guest room turned uh, turned office um, and just really honored to be here with you all today. Um, so I have a little bit of time to share with you, um, I, I think kind of four buckets. Um, so one, I wanna share with you a little bit about who I am and where I'm from. 
um, my uh, experience in organizing. You heard a little bit about it, but there's a little more to tell. And, um, and then a little bit more about my approach um, to organizing and the work that we all have collectively in front of us. And then finally, I'd love to end um, with some of our recent work, including the establishment of the Chush Fund and the Rogue Valley Relief Fund, um, and how we're partnering with Friends of the Columbia Gorge and other organizations um, to provide relief and support for communities most impacted um, by, by climate change uh, and other issues. So first a little bit about uh, who I am and where I'm from. Um, I was born and raised here in Portland, but uh, in the Portland metro area, uh, but my dad is from uh, Celilo Village and many of you might be familiar with him. Uh, his name is Ed Edmo. He's a traditional storyteller and um, uh, grew up in Celilo and later in Wishram after the dam was built in 1957. And a lot of what I do today is actually intimately related with who I am and where I'm from. Um, some of the first memories that my dad talked about of, of his growing up in the Dells um, was as his school's mascot. And uh, also that happened to be one of my first experiences in organizing was uh, working on the statewide ban for Indian mascots in K through 12 schools. Um, and so uh, I'll transition now into a little bit of my experience. Um, again, my first experience in organizing was, was with the Indian mascot band, but I really began my passion for um, the outdoors and the environment uh, in middle school. Um, I went to a school where uh, we were really blessed to have um, a really robust outdoor program. Um, so I, I started backpacking um, when I was 12 years old and it was amazing and um, loved uh, the camaraderie and um, the scenery and the challenge of, of doing that as a child. And uh, that grew into a wider passion for science and uh, environmental education. And the very first job that I ever had um, uh, was uh, my boss uh, at the time was Jeff Gottfried, who um, is, a, is also a friend of the Columbia Gorge. And uh, I was 15 and I became a camp counselor for a program called Salmon Camp, um, which is actually still running today. Um, so Jeff and uh, David Hatch, who um, has passed on now, but is a formal former council person for the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, um, really had this dream together of starting a camp by and for native kids um, that would follow the path of the salmon from the headwaters of the Warm Springs River all the way out to the ocean and Siletz. Um, and I was the first native staff that was ever hired um, to help be a part of the program. And it was such an honor um, and it's a program that still runs today uh, through the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, um, introducing now uh, generations of native students uh, to, to science um, and, uh, and the outdoors in, in many cases. Some come from uh, reservation communities where they're in the outdoors all the time or might be a farming or fishing family and others may be from um, the city where that's not as, uh, as much a part of their everyday life. One of the, one of the fun stories I'll tell you about um, in, in, in Salmon Camp actually happened uh, when we stopped on our way from Warm Springs uh, out to the coast. Uh, we stopped in, uh, in Lyle, Washington. And this was the mm, early to mid nineties. And if many of you were around during that time, you remember that there was a particular developer, I think they were from Massachusetts, who, um, who wanted to develop Lyle Point, which is a um, age old, it's uh, um, a fishing area for families along the Columbia that had been fished at for thousands of years. And um, this developer had even gotten so brazen as to build um, build some roads that um, that uh, paved over some of the 
um, some of the sacred places that were um, at Lyle Point. And so some folks uh, in the in tribal communities began to organize and um, built an arbor, um, set up some teepees, and were actually camping um, at Salilo, living at, not at Salilo, at Lyle. Um, and uh, I decided that um, as the kind of unofficial leader of Salmon Camp at the time, that that would be a great place for our students to come out and spend the night as we made our way to the coast. So we stopped there and we said, we said hello to everyone. And um, all of a sudden these uh, folks from the Columbia River Intertribal Fish, Fish Commission enforcement team. So the, the folks that um, uh, monitor and police the, the fishing that happens along the Columbia River, because you see people, Indian people don't fish on the Columbia as citizens of the United States. We, we fish as citizens of our tribal nations. And um, Critvik had seen, um, they had these infrared, these fancy infrared um, uh, uh, monitors that they had in their helicopters that go up and down the gorge. And from those helicopters, they can literally, and they could, they had the technology back then to tell the difference between um, a buoy or a duck, or in our case, um, probably about 30 more people who had joined this encampment. So I think their alarm bells kind of went off and, you know, what's going on here? This is a, um, it was thought of at the time as really a, a site of, of protest um, in, uh, in, in, in protection of the site as a traditional fishing site. Um, and so they thought, you know, maybe there are non Indian people here or what's happening, didn't know. And so they pulled up in their enforcement vehicles and found a whole bunch of native kids setting up camp and getting ready to cook dinner. Um, and it created this, uh, I think it's a something that many of the students who I was with at the time um, will probably never forget. And, um, it was, uh, and eventually, as you all know, uh, we fought that development. And uh, I think a lot of people joined that alliance and, and won, and it is one of my favorite memories um, of the time that, that I was at Salmon Camp um, when I was still in high school. Um, and I think much of my activism doesn't end there, right? So uh, obviously MRG, it, if I were to dream up a foundation with a mission, um, this would be it. Um, this, it's, it's a, a blessing of a place to be. The history of the organization is so deep. Um, we've been around for 45 years and uh, funding, as Kevin said, um, social, racial, economic, and environmental justice the entire time. Um, we've been the first funder of many amazing um, organizations that are still with us today, including Cascade AIDS Project, um, Columbia Riverkeeper, um, Street Roots, Apano, Unite Oregon, and most recently, um, we were the inaugural funder for the Oregon Worker Relief Fund, um, which uh, ha also happened to be the largest grant we've ever uh, made in our 45-year history of $185,000 that went to seed that fund, which is now the country's largest mass mutual aid program by and for undocumented people. Um, so part of this work I share in part to, to introduce the idea that, you know, we have linked fates. And as, um, as Kevin was sharing, um, it, this, uh, this idea that, you know, there is, uh, something that I think used to be talked about as mission creep is just a fallacy. It is, um, I think more and more I'm understanding the world and how we are interconnected and the issues that we fight for are also just that interconnected. And so have appreciated over the last year, um, I've actually never met Kevin in person or um, anyone else on staff um, here at Friends in person, but uh, a, a level of trust and um, and mutual respect has been um, shared amongst us over the last year. And it's really given us an opportunity as we um, work together to embrace that complexity, embrace, embrace the multiplicity um, and embrace what 
you know, what might appear as um, sometimes uh, conflicting um, goals or missions um, to talk about what is, you know, and I guess a little bit change, um, change the nature or the, the underlying assumptions in many of our conversations and start with what we, what we do agree on, what we would love to work for um, as a coalition. And I think um, those things uh, are important to be able to define um, and, and take me a little bit into, you know, talking about what my approach is and, and how I think about um, issues of, of both conservation and um, the, the honoring and protecting of treaties um, all in the same breath. Um, as we began our, our conversation, I'm a firm believer, right? We have social, political, and economic systems that have been working perfectly in sync to create the lived reality that we all have inherited today. Um, those systems also, and, and, and the way that I think about them is, you know, social, we've got nonprofit and philanthropic, political, we've got local, state, and federal government, tribal government, and, um, and economic, we've got business and enterprise development. So that's how, kind of how I think about it. Um, and, you know, as it relates to tribes, we have um, government to government uh, as the kind of law of the land that um, states and the federal government um, need to work with tribes on a, on a nation to nation basis um, about particular issues that impact um, the rights that they retained through treaties um, and, and other work that might impact those rights. However, there's not such the same obligation when we're talking about nonprofit or philanthropic or business and, and enterprise development. And that's the piece where I've started thinking and doing work in the space that I've um, started doing work in because, um, right, if these systems were perfectly designed to get the results that they're currently getting, I believe that it's those same systems that we need to work within and partnerships we need to develop to, in order to make it work the opposite direction, right? We move from a system that marginalizes um, tribes and tribal people to one that allows them to thrive as communities, as whole communities. Um, and, and with that, you know, and I think lessons I have taken from organizations like Columbia Riverkeeper who, right, in its organizational DNA has um, consulting with tribes and conferring with tribes as a, as a regular practice in the work that they do every day. Um, I think there are examples out there of, of nonprofits um, and of businesses that, um, that do embrace this, this idea of working in the, uh, working to undo historical and current um, wrongs. Um, so the, that's, I think, part of my approach. I also feel like, you know, government to government um, consultation with tribes, right, that's the floor. That's the bare minimum. And I would say we don't even do that well. Um, but if we all understood um, exactly what Melissa was talking about at the beginning of this webinar, right, um, that um, as you know, what is our, as, and I'm speaking, I guess, as a non-Indian person now, but what is our articulated, um, can we articulate our skin in the game at respecting and, and upholding tribal sovereignty? Um, and, and it is that, right, treaties actually don't give Indian people anything. They don't give us any rights. Um, they were the vehicle by which we retained we had the rights, we had all the sovereign rights, right? We had the rights over the land and the water and all of these things. But at the time of the treaty writing, what happened was we retained those rights to do certain things, you know, to hunt, to fish, et cetera, um, to write to an education and health. And, um, and beyond that, um, we ceded particular rights to non-Indian people um, to live and govern and do business on what is currently known as the United States or um, Oregon, or Washington, Idaho, et cetera. And I think the skin in the game is that non-Indian people only get to retain those rights if they uphold those treaties. And that's where I think understanding what is our everyday work, 
whether we work in you know, a, a social justice nonprofit or a, a conservation nonprofit, or we work in a, as a, you know, business in a particular sector, what becoming um, aware of uh, how treaty rights impact us every day and um, how it should and could um, impact our, our work or become a part of our work. Because realizing that, you know, all of our collective work either works to respect and uphold tribal sovereignty or undermine and ignore it. Um, and that's what leads me to the last piece of what I'd love to talk to you all about today, which is, um, which is the development of the Chush Fund work. You know, when the crisis at Warm Springs began happening, it was actually the night of our first, the first gala that, um, that I had ever attended for MRG. And um, my friend, Alyssa Macy, who is the COO of the tribe at the time was supposed to come out to support me and cheer me on on stage and um, texted me and, and let me know that she wouldn't be coming and, and that they were, and basically the nature of what they were dealing with, um, the water main break at Shutite Creek. And mind you, this was, oh my gosh, almost two years ago now um, that this happened. It was May, uh, May 31st, I think, of 2019 when this first happened. And I knew in, in supporting her um, and her leadership there, and, and also as a foundation that I didn't want to treat this tribe as if it were just another nonprofit grantee that there was something more that we needed to do. And um, because of my you know, relationships and familiarity with the tribe, um, I knew they didn't have a PayPal account. I knew that they, um, I knew, I knew that they um, banked at different places and, um, but I knew they didn't have a portal by which anybody could give to the tribe. And so um, that's kind of the fix that I focused on trying to solve is that there were a lot of people out there um, there's growing concern from the public, um, especially um, especially at the time, you know, as they were moving into what an, they anticipated um, to be a, another wildfire season here in the Northwest um, without access to water. Um, and so that's when we set up uh, the, the Memorandum of Understanding with the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, uh, as well as um, the, and that MOU was passed through tribal council um, by resolution, um, which established the Chush Fund as the main giving arm of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Um, the money that is transferred to the tribe uh, each month is uh, without restriction. And um, so the tribe has been able to, uh, use that pot of money as its most flexible um, dollars. As, as you can imagine, there might be state or federal or other kinds of grants that come in that are you know, very specific, very restricted as to what they can do. And we, we really didn't wanna put those kinds of restrictions on the community in the time of a, of, um, a health crisis and then a public health crisis and then the environmental crisis um, that was hitting them with the wildfires this last year. Um, so we left it very open and um, just stated that we believed in the leadership of um, both elected leadership and folks on staff to um, do all they needed to do to care for their folks in this time of crisis. And we stand by that today. Um, and the Chush Fund since then has raised just over $800,000 in the last two years um, in unrestricted funds that uh, have been transferred to the Confederated Tribes of, of Warm Springs. Um, and so I'll just share, which has been incredible. And we could not have done that without, you know, the alliance that friends um, intentionally brought together to um, help us create awareness about the crisis, um, help disseminate information about what was happening at the policy level and just bring it, you know, uh, bring it to the attention of everyday um, Oregonians, Washingtonians, um, Idahoans who cared about this issue and cared about their neighbors. Um, and the last thing I'll say um, on 
much of this work. And it's a teaching, I wanna share a teaching that has been shared with me from um, many of my elders. And it's something that I try my best to live by um, as I do the work that I'm doing and move through the world uh, today. And that is um, that our words are our prayers. Our words are our prayers. And so whether we're sitting with our family, families laughing, telling jokes, spending time with our children and our elders, or whether we're writing um, a new law, a policy, that all of your intentions for the kind of world that you want to bring into existence, that you want to call into existence, um, that those are the prayers for that world. Um, so choose your words well, partner as much as you can, and remember that your words are your prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Say Autumn, for taking the time to speak with us today and for sharing your knowledge at our annual meeting. Super, super grateful to get to know more about you, your work, your background, and um, just thank you so much. So now, um, if all speakers can turn their cameras on, we can go ahead and move into our Q&A session. And perfect. Okay, so for all of you at home, um, you can go ahead and please submit your questions into the Q&A box uh, found at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you would like to ask your question personally to the speakers, please, please use the raise hand function um, so we can promote you to speak. So the raise hand function is, al is also in the um, black box found at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and raise your hand and then we will go ahead and promote you so that you're able to unmute and uh, turn on your camera so you can uh, see the speakers and so we can see your beautiful face today. Um, please make sure to name which speaker you are directing your question to or state that you are asking this question to all speakers. All right, or, um, and just feel free to also, um, you know, just, just ask your question in, in the Q&A box and we will go ahead and read those. All right, so our first question is from Glennis. Um, and I'm going to say that this is, um, for say autumn, how have funds promised to the tribes by the feds recently helped? How have the funds promised to the tribes by the feds recently helped? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I will say there are some current um, federal, right? There's some current legislation in the hopper that may help uh, may, may help alleviate some of the infrastructure issues, um, but uh, none yet have um, transferred. And um, so that's where things, that's where things are at now. Kevin, you might have a better update. Um, well, there's, I know there is money that is, uh, this is separate from the Warm Springs water crisis, but that's going to the Lone Pine housing over uh, near the Dalles. And so that is funding that's been secured. In the current um, infrastructure legislation that is um, being pushed through uh, Congress right now, Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden have um, been able to push forward with legislation that has gotten out of its committee. And it actually, I think, got unanimous support. And it called for funding 10 water infrastructure projects for Columbia Basin tribes. And so it was really kind of targeting at Warm Springs. And it is um, a significant amount of money, tens, tens to 20 million a year for a number of years. Um, it, it is still, it's a huge project. I mean, Sea Autumn's work is so important, but the real long-term work is um, 
has to come from the federal government and should come from the federal government to, to really take over um, a water structure that is just decades and decades and decades old. So there is right now with the current administration, current Congress, uh, there's actually action going on. So I think our members, uh, if they are tuned in, they will see uh, alerts that we will be sending asking folks to um, try to get a house companion bill, et cetera. Thank you all. Okay, this next question is for C. Autumn. What is the status of the water project on the reservation now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so from what I understand, um, there is a price tag currently um, because it's not just the break at Shittite Creek that was the deferred um, deferred maintenance that had happened. Um, there were water main breaks actually multiple places within, um, within the infrastructure. And I've heard estimates um, anywhere from 180 million to 200 million. Um, but I think the real answer is nobody actually knows because it's actually that broken. Um, so, uh, but if you want to keep up um, with kind of what's going on on the ground right now, um, KWSO, the, the uh, radio station at Warm Springs is actually a really great resource. So if you want to um, no, is there a bottle uh, of boil water notice, notice happening right now um, or engaged right now? That's the place that uh, many tribal citizens go to find their information. Thank you. Okay, this question is for Kevin. What are the current challenges, legislative or others, that we can help with? Well, I, I think we're going to, the one I just mentioned is one that will be coming up. Um, the, uh, we're in addition on a state level, we are, we are monitoring what's going on in uh, Salem and Washington right now. There is actually a really um, hopeful uh, anti-hate crime bill that is going through um, the Oregon legislature right now. And what it would do is for anyone who commits a bias or hate crime on state lands, um, a judge would have the right to um, uh, remove folks from being able to use those lands uh, anywhere from six months to five years. And it would also include uh, the inability to get licenses such as for hunting or fishing. So this is something that we're monitoring. This is something that I'm sure we'll turn to members and ask for their support. In the coming year, uh, the Gorge Commission just finished this management plan. I talked about you know, great news on that front, but they are going to be working on a climate resilience plan. And they're gonna be working on an equity plan. So they also need input from the public uh, to make sure that the work they do really lives up to the aspirations that they talked about in these meetings over the last several years. So we'll be sending out information on that as well. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, um, this next question is for C. Autumn. Are you hopeful that the new Native American Interior Secretary will help? I mean, she's not going to be any worse than any other white dudes before her. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm extremely hopeful. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting um, Secretary Halland when she was out here um, actually campaigning um, and spoke with Renew Oregon and um, I was a supporter of their work and um, got to meet her at that point. So I'm extremely, um, I'm extremely hopeful. You know, my, my sister-in-law is an attorney and she works um, at the uh, regional solicitor's office, which is basically the attorney arm for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and such. And she said from day one, um, the, the feel was completely different um, that, uh, that Secretary Hallen did a um, Helen did, did a zoom call with like everyone in the agency and just 
right? Just completely flatten the hierarchy, set the tone um, for the work ahead in a very different way than how they had been treated the previous four years. Um, so um, there's a lot of hope, I think, in um, even in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and you wouldn't necessarily think that would be the place, but we actually have an amazing um, director, Brian Mercier is our, is our regional director for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And um, uh, he's a, a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Spring, uh, Grand Round. And um, he, uh, I think has an amazing approach as well. So it's not just at the, you know, at the higher um, levels, it's that kind of, um, kind of philosophy of, you know, the Bureau would love to eventually um, shrink their numbers and um, more and more have more funding, more autonomy, um, more support going to the tribes to um, be able to, um, you know, take those federal dollars and, and prioritize um, what they think needs prioritizing. But I think the key there mm -hmm. is um, advocacy for full funding. So full funding for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, full funding for the Indian Health Services, um, uh, so I think those pieces will begin to surface uh, later on. Thank you, Sayada. So much to be hopeful for. So let's see what happens. All right. This next question is for Kevin um, from Christopher Van Bemmel. Congratulations on the recent purchase of land on the Eastern Gorge and at Cape Horn. Are there other land preservation projects slash priorities in the future? Well, the short answer, Christopher, is there are always other priorities and projects in the future. We are always keeping our eye open. There's, um, and often some of these things, as we work on them, just by the nature of landowners, et cetera, has to, has to sort of stay under the radar and uh, confidential. It was very heartening um, just on, Friday, our land trust director and I went out and visited with a couple that own a beautiful property that um, is, they reached, they have not been members, but they read about the Catherine Creek purchase and they've lived there for 26 years, just been sort of quiet stewards of their land. And they would love first to see it um, be in conservation. So they reached out to us before they put it on the market. And so um, there are always these opportunities, and I think you will, you know, be hearing more about it in the coming uh, weeks and years. And but, but yes, the short answer is uh, yes. But right now, we still have so much work we need to do with the Catherine Creek and Cape Horn properties. Those are going to be our first priorities moving forward. Thank you, Kevin. This next question is for Say Autumn from Carolyn Stewart. What is happening in regards to housing and other improvements at in-lieu fishing sites? I think Kevin talked a little bit at the, about the Lone Pine um, site, but there are many other sites along the Columbia um, that are, I think about 30 between Oregon and Washington. Um, and a lot of that work is actually, so there's a new uh, nonprofit, um, right now it's fiscally sponsored by NAF Family Center called Enchuana Housing. Um, the former director of the housing um, housing over at Yakima Nation, Deborah Whitefoot, is is their executive director and really championing um, housing along the Columbia because it is going to be complicated. Um, that is for sure, um, right? Because many of these in lieu sites are are federally designated or held, um, and so some are the responsibility of the Army Corps engineer Army Corps of Engineers. Of course, there's um, also shared responsibility by the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Legally, actually, non-Indians can't go um, go into these areas. Um, and you'll see signs indicating that, um, which is, um, but they, which is uh, why many of them are fenced. Um, but uh, if you'll remember, uh, back in oh gosh, it must have been the early two thousands. Um, it it literally took an act of Congress, right, to get the Celilo redevelopment to happen. And that was $50 million and it had to be spent in that biennium so fast. Um, and the community there prioritized the building of the longhouse first and, and then, um, you know, focusing on the individual homes. But 
there's no other um, there's no other in lieu area um, that has had that level of support. And um, as you know, you know when the first you know, when the Bonneville dams went in, uh, there was that promise of housing to tribal people and many, you know, river families have not left those communities and um, uh, really are um, still waiting for that to happen. Thank you. Speaking of Bonneville, this is a question and I guess to all uh, from Wayne Schweinfest. What is the status of the sea line problem at Bonneville? Um, I guess I will start. So uh, for those who don't know, um, this is a really complicated issue. So there are uh, sea lions that um, travel up the, up the Columbia chasing salmon. And there are different species of sea lions. And one in particular, my understanding was never historically part of the Columbia River system, uh, more down in the Bay Area, but they have uh, come in um, like gangbusters and will uh, kind of perch right, right at um, Bonneville Dam and really uh, take a lot of sea lions or take a lot of salmon. And so um, Bonneville has tried to figure out how to deal with this. Um, there is uh, some marine mammal protections. Um, it's, it's a complicated issue because I think when they've tried to simply remove sea lions, ship them somewhere, they will come back. This year, I think the salmon runs are um, unfortunately not as high, but also that means there's probably less sea lions there. This is normally the time after our annual meeting, often people go out to Bonneville and want to see the sea lions. And so, um, but I, unless um, somebody's hearing things I haven't heard, I haven't heard anything about a proliferation of uh, sea lions like we've had in previous years where it's really been huge, but um, it's a complicated issue. And I think uh, tribes have, uh, are trying to protect uh, the salmon populations. So they've been involved, federal government is trying to protect um, the salmon populations plus the species, the sea lions themselves. So it is complicated. I, I, I don't quite know how else to say it. And, but as of now, I don't think it's peaking as it has been in previous years. If anybody else has any information, feel free to weigh in. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess a last call to our attendees today. Um, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and pop those into the Q&A box. Um, like I said, if you want to raise your hand and um, ask a question to our um, speakers, you, you can definitely do so. And Melissa, um, I just would add, um, Michael Lang, our conservation director, put in the chat, um, I was talking about the legislation and Thankfully, he's had some details here, but it's Senate Bill 421, the Western Tribal Water Infrastructure Act, 50 million per year for tribal drinking water projects, which a year ago, I never, ever, ever, ever would have thought we'd be there. So it's really a tremendous thing that uh, can, can just make a huge difference. So uh, that's gonna be something we'll be, we'll be pushing pretty hard to see that it, it crosses the finish line. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all today. Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, yeah, for, for taking the time um, to share your knowledge and, and your wisdom and your words. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, end the Q&A. Um, no other questions right now. So I'll go ahead and uh, just say a couple things before we go. So most years, um, you would have been invited to a legacy planning seminar just before this annual meeting. And like most other things this year, we've gone online with this free seminar and you still have time to sign up. This Thursday, April 22nd from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m., Friends is hosting a webinar with Melissa May, who is an estate planning, oh, 
sorry, uh, hosting a webinar with Melissa May, a state planning expert with Dury Keckel, uh, to provide an overview of planning your legacy. For friends, legacy gifts have been a catalyst to start our, our land trust, to hire a conservation organizer and support the organization as it grows. We'd love to have you join us. You can sign up on our website on the calendar page and stay tuned for more upcoming webinars this spring and summer, bringing you all of your favorite Gorge topics. I'd like to thank all of the photographers whose work was featured today and that Friends is fortunate to use in its work every day. In particular, I wanted to give special thanks to Sharon Philpot, whose beautiful photo of a lone tree at Coyote Wall was featured as our cover photo for this year's annual meeting. We hope you all enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to connecting with you all again in person soon. So thank you and farewell, everyone. Have a great Sunday. <laughs> Take care.